Okay, so we are in chapter three now. State space models. So we've been lay, uh, laying a little bit of a foundation for chapter three uh, by doing linear graph models in chapter two and then introducing uh, lumped parameter modeling in chapter one. So chapter three is kind of what we've been building up to. Uh, it culminates in a textbook in the Rowling Wormley text that will be chapter five that we're going to be working through. Uh, and it'll be over the next couple weeks that we're going to do chapter three in the, in the notes. Yeah, so uh, this week we get a good start on it. And then uh, next week, and we do one example at the end of the week. And then next week we do a couple more examples and then one more topic. So, yeah. Uh, great. And there are a couple typos, like I mentioned. So, uh, note those as we go. And, and this lecture is a little bit of review um, uh, with some of the topics that we introduced in chapter one. But I thought it would be good. It's like it's OK to review sometimes a little bit of material. And I think it'll help make it a little bit more concrete for you. So, uh, state variable system representation, lecture 3.1. State variables, typically denoted x sub i, uh, are members of a minimal set of variables that completely expresses the state or status of a system. All variables in the system can be expressed algebraically in terms of state variables and input variables, typically denoted ui. Okay, so we're saying, okay, state variables, we denote with x, input variables, we denote with u. A state determined system model is a system for which a mathematical description in terms of n state variables xi, two initial conditions xi at some initial time t naught, and the inputs ui for uh, all time greater than or equal to t naught are sufficient conditions to determine xi of t for all time greater than or equal to t naught. We call n the system order. Okay, so this is an uh, a definition that we already saw, state-determined systems. Um, but now we're going to talk a little bit more about it, and we're going to start using them. So I wanted to bring it, bring it back. Uh, the state input and output variables are all functions of time. Typically, we construct vector-valued functions of time for each. The so-called state vector x is actually a vector-valued function of time. So it takes in a value of time and it returns a vector. The ith value of x is a state variable denoted xi. So we just put all those state variables into a vector value function and go forth. Similarly, we call the, uh, the so-called input vector u is actually a vector valued function of time. u which takes in a value of time and returns a vector an R vector, uh, uh, where R is the number of inputs. The ith value of u is an input variable denoted ui. So we put all the inputs into a vector, uh, our vector value function. Finally, the so-called output vector y is actually a vector valued function of time, uh, which takes in a value of time and it returns an m vector, where m is the number of outputs. So we just put all the outputs into a vector value function as well. The ith value of y is the output variable denoted yi. Most systems encountered in engineering practice can be modeled as state determined systems, or uh, as state determined. Uh, for these systems, the number of state variables n is equal to the number of independent energy storage elements. We've been talking about energy storage elements, right? So we talked about a types and t types. And in the different domains we talked about, for electronics, the A-type was this, the capacitor, right? And the T-type was the inductor. Uh, in the mechanical translational system, the A-type was the mass, and the T-type was the spring. And then in the uh, mechanical rotational domain, we had the A-type being the rotational moment of inertia, and the T-type being the rotational spring, right? So these were our energy storage elements. And uh, the number of independent energy storage elements in the system is uh, equal uh, uh, as equal to the number of state variables n. 
So independence, we'll talk more about what that means and how to determine if, if uh, elements are independent. Most of the time they are. So it's usually if you see six different uh, en uh, energy storage elements in a system, usually you have six state variables. Usually they're all independent of each other. Um, occasionally they'll show up dependent on each other where you can't change them uh, uh, independently. Uh, and we'll talk about what to do in that case. Um, and then you have a, a one fewer, if, if two are, are uh, dependent on each other, you have one fewer state variable in that case. So um, starting to connect this number of state variables to the energy storage elements that we've been introducing now. Uh, so let's uh, let's just like remember this uh, this block diagram. We, we didn't draw. It wasn't as pretty when we did it the first time. But uh, we have our input vector valued function of time, u of t, uh, which is remember we define these all as column vectors, right? So u one of t, u two of t. Uh, all the way down to u r of t. So this is their r inputs. And we have that. And then inside the system, we have the state variables, right? So the state vector valued function x of t equals x1 of t, x2 t all the way down to x n of t. And then our output vector valued function y of t is equal to y1 of t, y2 of t, down to y m of t, the where there are m outputs. OK, so that's like our, our picture of it, right? Inputs coming in, state, uh, state, uh, state vector that's keeping track of the state of the system, and then and the outputs in, a, in an output vector. So since we know the state vector x, is to know everything about the states, the energy stored in each element can be determined from the state vector x. Therefore, the time derivative, dx dt, describes the power flow. So if we can describe the energy with the states, we can describe the power with the time derivative of the states. Um, the choice of state variables represented uh, by x is not unique. In fact, any basis transformation yields another valid state vector. This is because, despite a vector's components changing when its basis is changed, a symmetric change also occurs in its basis vectors. This means a vector is a coordinate independent uh, uh, quantity or, or object. Uh, and the same goes for vector valued functions. This is not to say that there aren't invalid choices for a state vector. There are. But if a valid state vector is given in one basis, any basis transformation yields a valid state vector. So you guys uh, uh, are either in linear algebra or took linear algebra at this point. And so hopefully you guys have talked about basis transformations by this point in the semester. Um, uh, we're not going to do a ton of them yet, but uh, uh, they're coming. Yeah. Question? Well, you know, at least for myself, I'm not taking any algebra. Huh? Well, or then you'll take it next semester. Uh, actually, the, we don't really do a lot with basis transformations till next semester. So it gets heavy next semester, but not so bad yet. Uh, mostly we're going to do vectors and matrix multiplication. That's about it. So not so bad. Stuff that, stuff that everybody has seen in pre-calculus, fortunately, um, and in uh, uh, vector calculus. So, uh, OK. 
Cool. One aspect of the state vector is, is invariant, however, it must always have order n. So it must always um, uh, be an Rn. So if you have eight independent energy storage elements, then your state vector must be in R8, right? It must have um, eight values in the, in the vector. Our method of analysis will yield a special basis for our state vectors. Some methods yield rather unnatural state variables. For example, the third time derivative of the voltage across a capacitor uh, is, is a sort of typical um, variable that you might have show up in, a, in like a third order uh, circuit analysis um, if you turn it into a state uh, space model. But ours will yield natural state variables. For example, we'll get the voltage across a capacitor or the force through a spring or the current through an inductor. These will be our state variables. So it depends. So, so they're valid. You can, do, you can do different constructions that are valid for state-based models. But the ones that we're going to come up with are going to be um, uh, all the state variables will be pretty natural quantities, which is nice. Because uh, then when you solve for the states, you know things about the, the system that are physically interesting to you, or they make physical sense to you. Instead of, like, if you go to higher derivatives of the position, for instance, if you go to like acceleration, and then what's the next one? It's like jerk. Mm -hmm. And then what's the one above that? There's another one. I forget what that one's called. But it becomes less and less physical, or like our intuition isn't as good when you start to talk about the time rate of change of the acceleration. It's like, OK, I can go there with you, jerk. And then it's like the next one, though. It's like the time rate of change of the time rate of change of acceleration, which is already the time rate of change of velocity, which is the time rate of change of position, which is just like a lot of levels to keep track of. So uh, it's, it's kind of nice to have these state variables show up as quantities that are not like high derivatives of things that we are interested in. So. Um, cool. So that's that's the sort of intro to the state variable system representation. Any questions on that? Good deal.